1928, Thomas Alva Edison receives the Congressional Gold Medal, the nation's highest civilian honor. At 81, he's a living legend. The man who'd laid the technological foundations for the 20th century and created motion pictures to record this new world for posterity, along with his own accomplishments. The first motion picture studio ever set up in the world was in the yard of my laboratory at West Orange. The building revolved to follow the sun. We dubbed it the Black Mariah. As recreated with his own invention, the motion picture, Edison was portrayed as a mix of Horatio Alger Pluck, homespun Yankee ingenuity, and visionary genius. These are scenes from a 1915 epic entitled The Benefactor. From the beginning, his life had the makings of a great movie. In a sense, Edison devised his own legend of, of this, this sort of rough-hewn inventor who uh, didn't pay much attention to science. In fact, Edison paid a lot of attention to science. What he didn't pay attention to was the kind of uh, higher-level pure science that didn't have immediate practical application. Thirty years old, Edison applied his practical genius and produced the talking machine. Topping himself two years later, he lit up the world with the electric light. By then, there were people who believed he could do anything. Most of all, Edison himself. Most inventors have rather large egos. They feel they can affect the way other people live their lives. And the way they can do that is not through management or necessarily through ideas, intellectual ideas, but rather through creating technologies and systems that people will live with and work with. Edison's self-absorbed involvement with his work had disastrous effects on a first marriage. Weakened by declining health, his wife Mary Stilwell died in 1884, neglected and mentally unstable. Left with three children, Edison remarried in 1887. His second wife, Mina Miller, was the daughter of a millionaire. Edison remained Edison, but with the support of family and friends, Mina was better prepared to be the wife of a man called the Wizard of Menlo Park. Bursting with ideas for new inventions, in 1887, Edison moved into a huge new laboratory complex in West Orange, New Jersey. Ten times larger than his old quarters a few miles away in the village of Menlo Park. For Mina and his children, he bought Glenmont, a lavish nearby estate. Settled in West Orange, it wasn't long before Edison found himself at his desk in his library thinking about the realization of a very old dream, moving pictures. This book, written in 1646 by Affamatius Kircher, a Jesuit priest, records the early history of projected images. It began with the magic lantern, forerunner of today's slide projector. The magic lantern was a device that used light from a lamp to project images painted on glass plates. The effect on viewers was truly magical, and these were only static drawings. Eager for the energy of motion, early inventors created ingenious devices to add life to their shows. Slides with movable parts were popular. A more sophisticated illusion of movement came in 1834 with the creation of the zoetrope by English inventor George Homer. Here, spinning sequential images appear to move. It was an example of a physiological phenomenon described in 1884 by Peter Marc Roger of thesaurus fame. It's called Persistence of Vision. With cinema, when you project an image on the screen, which creates the illusion of motion, what you're projecting on the screen is really a series of still photographs. And what happens is that the eye synthesizes these slightly different photographs in such a way that it creates the illusion of motion. A popular early toy illustrates this synthesis or blending by the brain. 
when a card with a picture of a bird on one side and a picture of a bird cage on the other is twirled rapidly, the brain combines the two pictures, creating the illusion that the bird is in the cage. The zoetrope and many devices like it became popular in 19th century parlor amusements. But in 1829, a vital step in the evolution of the motion picture took place. Louis Daguerre perfected a truly magical technology, photography. Now, for the first time, a glimpse of the real world had been captured forever, frozen on a light-sensitive glass plate. But creating early photographs took as long as five minutes per image, too slow for movies. By the 1870s, faster picture-taking was possible. This allowed Edward Muybridge, studying the movement of animals, to make another major step toward motion pictures. California railroad magnate Leland Stanford hired Moybridge to prove a bet. Did all four hooves of a running horse ever leave the ground at the same time? Working at Stanford's Palo Alto farm, Moybridge lined up a series of cameras along a short track. Threads stretched across the track were attached to each of the camera's shutters. When a horse raced by, it broke the threads, which in turn released the camera shutters one after another. The result was a series of sequential photographs. Sure enough, there was a time when all four of the horse's legs were off the ground, but more important, Moybridge painted copies of his photographs on a glass wheel and created a viewing device called the Zoopraxiscope. For the first time, there was a photographically accurate illusion of movement. When Thomas Edison heard of Moybridge's work, he was intrigued. In 1888, he and Moybridge met. Who knows what they talked about entirely, but certainly one thing they did talk about was how to possibly link the zoopraxiscope with Edison's phonograph. Ed Edison had sort of found uh, to his surprise that some of his competitors had made major innovations uh, on his tinfoil phonograph and he was trying to one-up them. Photographs that moved and talked, now that would shake up the competition. But work on movies didn't begin immediately. Edison's restless mind was elsewhere. At a mine he owned in nearby Ogdensburg, he was focused on a little-known obsession of his life, a machine to separate iron ore with large magnets. It was typical of Edison to work on many ideas at the same time. In 1888, moving pictures was added to his list. To help, he chose a trusted assistant from the ore mining project, William Kennedy Laurie Dixon, an avid photographer who took most of the pictures around the lab including this famous portrait of Edison as the Napoleon of invention. The motion picture project was perfect for Dixon. From the beginning, Edison conceived of a motion picture machine linked to the phonograph, sound and pictures together. On October 8, 1888, he wrote a caveat or preliminary announcement of his work in progress. I am experimenting upon an instrument which does for the eye what the phonograph does for the ear, which is the recording and reproduction of things in motion. The new invention was called the kinetoscope from the Greek words for motion and view. Dixon's job was to turn this exotic name into a working machine. With time, his role changed from assistant to collaborator, to some say, unaccredited co-inventor. Edison literally was not present in West Orange five or six days of the week. He was up in northwestern Jersey on his iron ore mine. Dixon was the proprietor of the lab, and he was the man who was working most closely on developing the technology for the motion picture. 
Edison's first idea was to wrap a piece of film on a cylinder and expose a spiral of tiny photographs. But to fit on a phonograph cylinder, Dixon needed to make the pictures extremely small. Produced sometime in 1889, these are frames from the earliest surviving motion picture, nicknamed Monkey Shines. To see them, a viewer had to look through a microscope. Here, the individual frames have been reconstructed into movement. An agile pipe fitter from the island of Malta was drafted to star. Lasting only a few seconds, the image was crude and the sound now lost, unintelligible. Still by the end of 1890, after centuries of searching, false starts and dead ends, the dream of moving pictures was about to be realized. But Edison and Dixon weren't the only men nearing the solution. When Thomas Edison began experimenting with motion pictures in 1888, he wasn't alone. In the later part of the 19th century, there were a whole series of technological innovations that really made the cinema, made modern motion pictures possible. And there were an array of people uh, in Europe, uh, in France, in England, in Germany, in the United States, who were experimenting with these elements and trying to pull them together in things that resembled motion pictures. In France, there was Etienne Jean Marais. Like Edison, Marais was influenced by Edward Muybridge's work. He too was interested in studying the movements of animals with photography. But unlike Moybridge's multi-camera setup, he developed a single camera system. Moray's camera looked like a rifle, but the cylinders of his photographic gun contained lenses, not bullets. When he pulled the trigger, the cylinder revolved taking sequential photographs on a strip of film. In 1889, with his cylinder motion picture work approaching a dead end, Edison decided to go to Paris for an exhibition marking the 50th anniversary of the invention of photography. At the exhibition, Edison's display of electrical marvels was a Parisian triumph, as memorable as the new Eiffel Tower. Motion pictures were probably far from his mind. Despite this, unknowingly, Edison was also approaching a turning point in his work toward true moving pictures. In Paris, he met many scientists and researchers. Etienne Jean Marais, the inventor of the photographic gun, was one of them. It's very important to remember this in terms of understanding Edison's successful inventive process. He did not get these ideas simply out of some corner recess in his brain. He read widely, he attempted to find out what everybody else was doing in order to incorporate these ideas and give them a new twist. Back in America in October 1889, Edison changed the direction of his motion picture research. He abandoned the cylinder concept. Instead, he wanted perforated strips of film, a variation of Moray's idea. Edison's assistant, W.K.L. Dixon, was soon at work on a new motion picture machine. Unlike today's cameras and projectors, the film moved laterally through the mechanism, not top to bottom. In March of 1890, Dixon was ready to show his preliminary handiwork. Edison was impressed. That's it, he said. Work like hell. Dixon did. Working with his partner, machinist Thomas Heiss, the two are seen on a frame from an 1892 experimental film. Together, they were inventing motion pictures. They started with film strips three-quarter inches wide, moving later to one-and-a-half-inch strips, close to today's standard of 35 millimeter. 
sprocket holes were punched with a manual perforator. On May 20th, 1891, Dixon had made enough progress for a surprise premiere. On that day, a group of women were visiting Edison's wife, Mina, at Glenmark. They were ushered into the lab where one by one they were asked to look into a wooden box. Inside, they saw something startling. A photograph of Dixon that moved. The little black and white image gallantly removed his straw hat. These are the few remaining frames of that landmark movie. Minus luncheon guests were the first outsiders to see the still experimental kinetoscope in action. And Edison's little surprise wasn't a casual decision. Edison was aware that he was working against a, a whole group of would-be competitors. And so I think as soon as an experiment was perfected uh, or, or even able to be shown, he would find an opportunity or an excuse to show it to a public because that became key evidence in patent battles. But he would always maintain that it had been around for a long time so that if someone, you know, came up with an earlier date, you know, he could fudge it a little bit. And he, in fact, was the master of fudging dates. Despite its private debut for Minus Friends, the kinetoscope still needed work. The images were blurry and the action jerky. But instead of rushing to improve his invention, Edison turned again to other work. It seemed like he was always juggling too many projects. This notebook contains strips of experimental film side by side with notes for Edison's ore mining project. It wasn't until a year later, July 1891, that he applied for the kinetoscope's first basic patent. Only two years later, in 1893, Edison's fortunes were down. He was in need of another money-making marvel. He decided to announce the kinetoscope at the Columbia Exposition in Chicago but the machine was far from finished. Forced to divide his time, W.K.L. Dixon worked feverishly to perfect the bulky mechanism. In the process, he worked as designer, engineer, projectionist, and often actor in the early films. Here, he plays the violin into a phonograph recording horn. The sound has been lost. A means to synchronize sound in pictures remained elusive. The pressure on Dixon kept building until he snapped. Dixon ended up with a nervous breakdown. He was pursuing too many of Edison's ideas simultaneously. The work schedule was insane. He collapsed and had to go down to Florida for a number of months. The deadline for the Columbia Exposition came and went. It was a major opportunity lost. But Edison still seemed unsure about the value of his moving image machine. In 1893, he wrote to Edward Moybridge, I have constructed a little instrument I call the kinetograph, but I'm very doubtful if there's any commercial feature in it. Edison had missed his opportunity to show he was first with the motion picture machine, but there were others close behind. The main theme of the 1893 Columbia Exposition in Chicago was electricity. Exposition halls were filled with the giant dynamos spawned by Edison's creation of the first electric lighting system in 1882. Edison was chosen as the living American who would most be remembered a hundred years later, 1993. Not far from the truth, but Edison's most recent invention, a moving pictures machine, was nowhere to be seen. Later, in 1893, anxious to demonstrate his lead, Edison held a public showing of the kinetoscope for a group of scientists at the Brooklyn Institute of Arts and Sciences. The film he showed was one of Dixon's mini-movies, The Blacksmith Shop. 
These are two frames from that film. In 1894, Dixon's health had improved and he was back in the lab. His first assignment, design and build the first movie studio. Constructed at a cost of $638, covered with black tar paper, it resembled a 19th century police patrol wagon and was called the Black Mariah. A model shows how a section of the building's roof opened to let in the light and the whole structure turned on a rail track so that it could follow the sun. Early film needed bright sunlight to produce clear images. Making movies in the Black Mariah was slow and hot. Working with the bulky equipment, it often took Dixon a week to get 15 seconds of usable film. This is the kind of camera he used, called a kinetograph. One of the first movies produced in Dixon's Black Mariah studio starred a co-worker, Fred Ott. The Sneeze. It was short and to the point. In 1894, with an application signed by Dixon and submitted with a 50-cent fee, the Edison Kinetoscopic Study of the Sneeze was the first film to be copyrighted with the Library of Congress. Hardly born, the movies began taking their first full strides. The day would come when a single film would cost over a hundred million dollars. Edison's account books show that the entire process of creating the first kinetoscope was $24,118.04, about $200,000 today. Edison never avoided a profit. But despite Dixon's progress, he continued to delay commercial release of the kinetoscope. Without sound, he wasn't satisfied. It took others in his company to push the silent kinetoscope into the marketplace. In 1894, a group of outside investors bought 25 kinetoscopes and set up shop with 10 machines at 1155 Broadway, New York City. Edison made sure he got hefty royalties from their efforts. The first movie premiere was April 14, 1894. The kinetoscope was an instant sensation. Soon kinetoscope parlors were all the rage. An early special event was a boxing match between former champ gentleman Jim Corbett and a punching bag challenger named Pete Courtney. Sweating in the impressive heat of the Black Mariah, Dixon shouted instructions to make sure Corbett knocked out his opponent during the appointed sixth round and in a spot where the action could be in focus. In kinetoscope parlors, one round of the fight was assigned to each of six machines and viewers paid 50 cents to move from machine to machine until they reached kinetoscope number six and the climactic knockout. Other less violent fare also attracted predominantly male audiences, like the risque Carmen Cita's dance. The movie certainly didn't begin as high-class entertainment, but they reflected Edison's down-to-earth taste. After the Black Mariah was built, you began to see a stream of entertainers, vaudeville acts, the world's strong man of the time, Eugene Sandow, come to the laboratory at West Orange to perform in front of the camera. Edison would go out, he would horse around with Sandow, the reporters were there every time one of these films were taken and they'd write headlines like world's smartest man meets world's strongest man. Uh, everybody had a good time and the lab staff got free passes to Broadway shows. As simple as the early movies were, the power of the new medium quickly made itself known, pushing 19th century proprieties. This film was called Her First Cigarette. These early kinetoscope films, in important ways, had a major impact on American culture right from the start. A lot of these films were of, of things that were really forbidden to be seen in the flesh. 
His motion pictures really from the outset sort of turned uh, commercial popular culture on its ear. I mean, he was, it was a very disruptive force. By 1895, kinetoscope audiences were increasing. But Edison's partner, Dixon, wanted to take the invention one step further and project the images on a screen. Edison vehemently disagreed. Why kill the goose that lays the golden egg, he insisted. If he felt that you were infringing upon him in any way, questioning his authority, uh, questioning his integrity or his imagination, differing with the direction that he thought should be taken in a given project, then he could become very contrarian, uh, arbitrary, angry, um, he, would, he could stop speaking to you for 25 years. Whatever Edison thought, ambitious entrepreneurs weren't waiting for the wizard to come up with a projecting kinetoscope. Frustrated with lab managers and eager to innovate, W.K.L. Dixon started working on a projection system of his own, in secret, with someone else. In 1895, frustrated with his boss's refusal to develop a projection system, Edison project manager W.K.L. Dixon had begun working with Edison competitors. When his activities were discovered, he was forced to leave the lab. Edison felt he'd been double-crossed. Dixon went on to help found the new movie company American Mutoscope. As competition to the kinetoscope, American Mutoscope created a peep show machine that used images on file cards that flicked past the viewer. This simpler system was cheaper and more reliable than the film-based kinetoscope. At the same time, Dixon and his partners pushed ahead on a projection system. It was a worldwide race. In France, there were two brothers, Auguste and Louis Lumiere, owners of a successful photographic equipment business. Their Lumiere motion picture machine was called the Cinematograph. Light and portable, unlike Edison and Dixon's bulky apparatus, the Cinematograph's elegantly designed camera projector also reduced Edison's 46 frames per second speed to 16 frames for quieter, less jittery projection. Also, rather than using bulky electric power, the Lumiere camera was hand-cranked, ready to go anywhere. This is one of the early Lumiere films. They were first projected on a large screen on December 28, 1895. Taking advantage of the cinematograph's portability, Lumiere Films delighted audiences with scenes from everyday life. In contrast to Edison's vaudeville acts and stage presentations. Back in America, a few weeks ahead of the Lumieres, Charles Jenkins and Thomas Armat demonstrated another projection system in September of 1895. They called their projector the Fantascope. By rapidly starting and stopping the film as it passed through the projector, the Fantascope eliminated the annoying flicker in Edison's continuous motion kinetoscope. Edison was stubborn. It was usually his way or not at all. But with audiences demanding movies on a screen, he was finally convinced to put his name on a projector. Not his. He licensed the machine invented by Jenkins and Armat. They renamed it the Vitascope. The Vitascope motion picture projector debuted on April 23, 1896 at Coster and Beale's Music Hall in New York City. Modern movies were born. For audiences, it was love at first sight. The most impressive short film was of 
surf crashing onto the shore at Dover. And this was a film loop that was repeated over and over again. And a number of people in the audience so struck by the realism of this dived under their seats, thinking that they were going to get hit by a wave. Unacknowledged in the back of the house, Thomas Armand, one of the Vitascope's true inventors, watched his machine making sure everything went well, while audiences cheered Edison's latest marvel. The Edison name meant box office. The Kiss was one of Edison's earliest hits. It recreated a scene from a popular Broadway show and had the further distinction of inspiring probably the first competitive movie remake. In April 1896, after six years, Edison's patent on the fundamental motion picture system was approved. But even that didn't stop the competitive warfare. In Europe and the United States, alternative projecting machines were popping up everywhere. Everybody was suing the daylights out of everybody else, trying to promote their own competitive position. And everybody was probably guilty of shading the truth uh, in terms of arguing what they had really done and making claims against their, against their competitor. Not even legal turmoil could stop the growing influence of motion pictures. From storefronts, special places for movies evolved. They were called Nickelodeons. Combining peep show arcades with projection theaters, Nickelodeons began providing popular entertainment for middle class audiences. Next came theaters dedicated to projected films. One of the first was Tally's in Los Angeles. Early motion picture audiences were whisked around the world and across the country. Vanishing people and places were captured forever. Perceptions of time and distance had begun to shrink. It didn't take long for the power and influence of the movies to be appreciated. In 1898, W.K.L. Dixon, now living and working in England, scored another motion picture first when he was granted permission to film Pope Leo XIII in the Vatican. Dixon's career in Europe would eventually go into gradual decline, but in Paris, he proudly posed with fellow movie pioneer Etienne Jeune Marais. Back in America in 1900, the Edison Motion Picture Company gained another influential employee. His name, Edwin S. Porter. This 1902 Edison film made by Porter, Jack and the Beanstalk, is typical of its time. All the action is taken from one unmoving position. Audiences were getting bored. Porter recognized that the movies need new forms. The question was how to find uh, a new kind of subject matter that would get people back in the theaters. Uh, and the solution really was a simple one. It was the story film. A landmark in his development is this 1903 film Porter made for Edison, The Great Train Robbery. Here is certainly the first movie western although its claim to be the first film to tell a story could be challenged by European movies of the day. Still, Porter's film shows how far motion picture technique had come in little more than a decade, including special effects like the image of a train inserted in the station house window. With longer storytelling films, movies were even farther than ever from the first kinetoscope entertainments. But despite Porter's example, Edison was slow to go into feature-length film production. When Porter resisted making movies like factory products in 1909, Edison fired him. It was the beginning of the end for the Edison Motion Picture Company. Edison was never interested in being a film producer. In the end, he left it to others to turn an ingenious technology into the 20th century's most powerful communications medium.
From short vignettes, by 1902, movies were exploring new forms. The film, A Trip to the Moon, represents an explosion of innovation. It's the work of French magician filmmaker Georges Méliès. Even before Edison employee Edwin S. Porter Méliès and other French filmmakers were beginning to tell stories in motion pictures. Inspired by the Lumiere brothers, Méliès was creating dramas that could only be presented on film. It was a new means of storytelling and the beginning of a new art form. For Edison, there were opponents overseas as well as at home. Edison was always trying to defend his position. He, after all, he started off as the only motion picture producer in the world. Pretty soon the French were coming in, then he had a whole series of American competitors. He always felt he was on the verge of sort of being marginalized, being put out of business. And he was trying to defend himself and his commercial interests. And, and of course, one of his greatest strengths was his patents. In 1909, in the midst of continuing industry warfare for mutual survival, Edison and his biggest competitors decided to call a truce. They joined together in the motion pictures patent company, an attempt to wrest control of a movie business running wild with foreign companies and independent entrepreneurs. Hired enforcers raided non-patent company productions, sometimes shooting holes through bootleg cameras. Kodak's George Eastman joined Edison and refused to sell film stock to independents. Such actions led producers to move farther away from New York and New Jersey, where most movies were made. Eventually, many settled in a rural town near Los Angeles. The area had good climate, varied location possibilities, and also it was convenient to the Mexican border in case of trouble from Edison's patent men. The new film center was called Hollywood. Finally, after years of court fights, independent producers William Fox and Carl Lemley, founder of Universal Studios, won. But by that time, Thomas Edison was no longer a movie producer. In 1911, before he left movies to others, Edison made one last attempt at an old dream, motion pictures with synchronized sound. Silent films were never really silent. Live offstage sound effects were often used and music from a single piano to a full symphony orchestra was common. True synchronized sound, however, remained elusive. Spurred by recent improvements in his phonograph, Edison linked his sound machine with his movie equipment. The result was the Kinetophone. The Kinetophone was nothing more than a variable speed control on the phonograph that allowed the projectionist to adjust the sound to keep it in sync with the picture. Hopefully. In February 1912, 50 Kinetophones were introduced into the theaters. The New York Times reported gasps of astonishment. But soon, sound and picture began to drift apart. After the audience's expectations had been built up, to have the sound seriously out of sync with the performance on the screen led to uproar, people hooting, ridicule, uh, critical newspaper articles making fun of this. And uh, certainly Edison wasn't pleased about ending up being an object of uh, ridicule after all of the effort that he put into this technology. So ended the longest single experiment in the history of Edison's laboratory. On March 30th, 1918, the inventor sold his Bronx studio and all his motion picture interests. The end of his interest in the motion picture was more than the result of financial failure. It was also part of a pattern in his life. He lacked the capacity for sustained research in a single field. 
He starts in telegraphy. He gives up telegraphy. He moves to telephony. He gives up telephony. He moves to the phonograph. He goes to the electric lighting system. He comes back to motion pictures, which all of which have combinations and bits and pieces of each other, but which are not, in fact, the same system. While Edison drifted away from the movie business, the silent film was maturing into the central art form of the 20th century. D.W. Griffith would soon create the controversial classic Birth of a Nation. An English music hall comedian, Charlie Chaplin, would become first and perhaps the greatest international movie star. All this hardly 30 years after W.K.L. Dixon's pioneering experiments in the Black Mariah. But in the 1920s, no one knew Dixon's name. Thomas Edison was the inventor of the motion pictures, a living legend. He became the most uh, widely uh, known inventor of, of the age in surveys of the uh, you know, top ten figures in history. Edison often uh, figured near the top, sometimes at the very top. Uh, very unusual for an inventor who were often seen as kind of odd folks. Um, yet here was Edison uh, seeming to be both every man and this great genius at the same time. 1927 was a landmark year. It was Edison's 80th birthday, but it was also the year that produced the jazz singer, the first successful talking picture. Movie technology had passed him by, but the old wizard could still charm newsreel reporters, poking fun at his lifelong hearing problem. What do you problem. think of the sound pictures of today? You ask what I think of the talking picture? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I never heard one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a little trouble now and then, but that's because I'm getting old. But I'm not a lot of ginger yet. <laughs> Four months later, the wizard of Menlo Park was dead. The world mourned the man whose legend claimed the phonograph, the electric light, and the movies. Something so incredible. I trust my own... In 1935, four years later, suffering from hard times, another man died quietly in England, William Kennedy Laurie Dixon. To the end, Edison considered Dixon a double-crosser. Edison, and certainly the Edison legend, left no room for co-inventors. In fact, it was a true collaborative effort. Both of their roles were essential to achieve success. Despite Dixon's key role, other Edison scholars argue that Edison might have found another Dixon. But Dixon could never have found another Thomas Edison. This is Edison's death mask, never before seen on television. His expression serenely confident to the end, dogged and determined, ruthless when he needed to be, Thomas Edison may not have thought of all the ideas of his invention, but he was the man who got them made. Tonight on Modern Marvels Wednesday, when you gotta pull it, push it, lift it, or drag it, you need a marvel that's worked for thousands of years. From oxen to airplanes, you'll always find them at the forefront of towing on Modern Marvels. Tonight at 8 on the History Channel. The Rocky Mountains stand across the heart of America like a wall. They are a massive, jagged spine of earth and snow-capped rock that rises in some places over 14,000 feet. The mountain's stern, tree-covered slopes divide the continent. Water that falls on the eastern slope of these mountains eventually ends up in the Atlantic Ocean, 